Okay, so our next speaker traveled up from Southern California just for today. She just landed a couple hours ago. Her name is Eden Harmon Bernardi, and she's the highly regarded founder of Stanley Street, which is a company that collaborates in the development of film and television roles with actors, writers, and directors. Her clients have included Academy Award winners and new media developers. In 2015, Eden launched a program called House Sessions to help fortify both established and emerging artists. Today, she will be speaking on time travel, how artists navigate the challenging moments. Another title for this is Debunking the Power of Now. So please join me in welcoming Eden. This isn't very fair. I think you're all very hungry at this point. And I'm going to be talking in grave detail about sensory work and food and drinks. And so hopefully we'll all have a wonderful meal when we're done. Um, truth be told, I'm a little nervous. I speak to groups of 100, 500, 2,000. But when I do that, I speak as an expert. Uh, it's so lovely to be an expert. And I talk to actors about our craft and directors and filmmakers. But today I'm talking about being human which means I have to be human. And I spend most of my time with liars, con artists, and thieves. I like them. I like storytellers. I like people who steal our hearts. I like people who trick us into believing other realities are possible. But the fact is, there's a myth about acting. The myth is that it's lying, that it's pretend. When in fact, what actors do when they make you believe what actors do when they make you believe is exactly what you do when you're in crisis and so I set things up today so that I would be a little bit in crisis because it felt to me that the talk would be inauthentic if I'm talking about navigating crisis and I'm in my Namio Horenge Kyo vibe or I'm feeling the comfort of being an expert. Uh, it didn't strike me that this was the place to pull out my liar, my con artist, or my thief, except maybe to steal your attention for a few minutes. So actors tell the truth. They don't lie. The events are false. The character is not who they are. But the emotional truth, the work they do to find that, is rigorous and it's difficult, and it's challenging, and it tears you up. And it does to your brain, as you can see in my little illustration here, very much what life does to your brain. So I don't know if I've got any thronesies here. I'm going to apologize ahead of time. I've got three thronesy things I'm going to talk about. That would be Game of Thrones for those of you that are television illiterate or think it's the demon seed. So. When this actress has to walk naked through a village of people pelting her with vegetables and body parts, while an evil nun walks behind her ringing a bell saying, shame, it was one of television's great moments. Because when television gets it right, they depict something that's very real that goes on inside all of us in a fun, dramatic way that lets us distance ourselves just enough to point, like the crowd at Circe, and not really have to stand fully in our shame, in our uncertainty, but the actress had to. She had to go there. And so in our work with actors, I, um, the world calls me an acting coach. I call myself a role collaborator. Uh, I don't think it's my job to teach acting. By the time they come to me, they've been trained. I work with them on developing the role for the film or the series, so it is an artist collaboration and we go in very deep. So why are we gonna talk about acting tools when we're talking about being human? Because, like it says up on my board there, because in reality, our reality is a big show. Now that's just a philosophical mindset, but it's such a useful mindset when you're losing your shit. When your life is turning upside down and you're in a panic and Trump is on television again, you have to say to yourself, right, there's even a show, one of the new shows called The Biggest Show on Earth, which is following the campaigns. 
He's the host of a reality show. It's easy for us to see this in the context of theater. I mean, what is our politics if not theater? What is our life if not something that has an entrance, a performance, and an ending? And so the parallels I'm not going to exhaust you with, but we've found over the years that the tools I need to bring to actors to help them live your lives, to help them live the lives of character authentic authentically, are the same tools we need as humans when we're navigating a crisis. Now we're going to talk about seven, what I call seven everyday tools. These are tools we use to slay dragons. On Game of Thrones, perhaps we're not slaying dragons, love the dragons, I'm a Daenerys, I'm in that camp. I want Jon Snow and Daenerys to partner up, but I digress. Because when we're in a crisis, it's hard to hold focus. When we're in a crisis, our minds go wandering, the heart is pounding, we start to sweat, we lose our way, and there's really only one way back. Because part of what's happening in a crisis is we're isolating. And when we isolate, we get lost. When we connect with another human being, we're found. And so when I look at you and I connect with you, a very fundamental acting tool, I'm not scared anymore, because now it's me and this lovely fellow, or that fellow back there with my father's beard, right? I can't see your eyes very well. It's contacts for distance and readers for now. That's where I am in life. But I can see that smile forming through that beard, and I can see that warmth and that connection. And for just a moment, I'm not up here playing the expert. For just a little moment, I'm human. I ask myself in that moment to get there. I don't just look at you if you notice. I'm doing something in my head. You can see my eyes, like you can see the eyes in a great film or a great piece of theater. You can tell if the actor is bullshitting and you push away, you check out from the film. I mean, if there's enough action for some people, they don't need that level of truth, but I'm not talking about that kind of work. I'm talking about the imitation game. I'm talking about a beautiful movie I just worked on called Free Indeed about a terrible crisis that happened in Memphis where a, a woman of faith lost her child to a um, faith healing ceremony and what happened to her and how that came about. What I'm doing when I look at you is I'm asking myself a question. I'm asking what it's like to be human for you because that's something I'm really not an expert about. That's the one thing we think we really know. We think we really know how to be ourselves, how to be a person. I've got being a person down. I've been doing that for 52 years. But the woman here with the dog and the lustrous hair, I don't know what it's like to be human for you. And if I start to make assumptions about what that's like, a disconnect happens. But if I really ask, we're both women, we got some big boobs, we got some festive hair, I'm not pink, but I got some gray and gold going on, right? So I'm looking for an empathetic connection. I'm looking to see if I can feel what you're feeling. You're much more comfortable than I am. You have the puppy on your lap. You have your friends around you. But with all this focus put on you, you could be starting to go into crisis the way an actor does when the camera turns to them and all the media focus is on them. Or you may already have tools to navigate that. But what I know for sure is as long as I stay with you, you're going to be OK. It's going to hurt a little when I go. We'll talk later. All right. So what are these seven magical tools that actors use? Let's get to it. You're not going to like the first one. I'm going to warn you about something right now. I was walking around and looking at all of you before, and it's very clear to me that um, this gentleman right here in the front, that you're dying. And, and that lovely camouflage gray behind you, I, I, you're dying. Uh, yeah, I did a check. In fact, it pretty much looks like everybody here over puberty on the way out. There's one person I met here today not dying. There is a gorgeous person inside of Alexandra's belly, and that person is growing and getting ready to have a womb death to leave the body behind, to let the birthing part end and be born into this life. So the first thing actors have to do is talk about death and dying. Good fucking grief. I thought this was a cheery good time talk with the actor lady from LA. But all the plays and all the movies are about it. 
and all our bullshit is about running from it. There was a book in the 70s called The Denial of Death. It really hits it very hard, but we always recommend it to actors because so much of our neuroses and our humanity comes out of that dread, that terror. Not so much of dying, but of the abyss beyond. For people of faith, they got an edge up on that. For people like me who have incredible faith in the creative imagination, it's a little bit scary. It's enough to create panic. So Shakespeare tries to simplify it. He tries to say, well, it's, it, what is it? It's not a big deal. You know the famous line, all together now? To be. Exactly. Or not to be. He cuts through all the horseshit. He doesn't give a big fancy speech. People always think Shakespeare is such fancy language. He's so good at cutting through the language and just saying what's true. To be or not to be. And an actor can't say that line. There's a lot of reasons that line is hard to say, the audience's expectation and the zillion times they've heard it done brilliantly, but that's really not what makes it hard. Ask the great actors who've done it. It's that you have to stand there in that moment and several times throughout that play and truly stand in your fear of the abyss of death. So what do we get out of that? Why would we do it? Why would we face death? Well, acting class number one, the denial of death doesn't really work. And those monsters get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they come plundering out of the closet, and they tear our lives apart in lots of different ways. There are people who would say that addiction, uh, ridiculous, dangerous promiscuity, uh, casual mistreatment of drivers of color is all coming from this terror of death. Let's look at how some other cultures do it. Let's be actors for a moment, immersing our lives in another culture, perhaps a Native American in a Hamas tribe where there is a practice, there was a practice of leaving the dead in their own teepee, if you will, structure of sticks and cloth, and they decay there right with the tribe, and people and families and friends go and visit. The person is still a part of their lives. They start to stink. They start to get bugs. Eventually, they turn into something different, and they become part of the soil, and the tribe watches it. They don't put their dead in a box with nice, clean satin linings and bury them six feet down and go have whiskey. I like the whiskey part, don't get me wrong. Big whiskey girl. But the denial of death implied by that kind of burial freaks me out. There is a tribe, I'm going to get the country wrong, so I'm not going to try and say it. It's southern Africa, it's a rural tribe that makes bone soup. They burn you up, then they take your bones, and they grind them up, and I have the wrong slide there for you. They make bone soup. And everybody in the tribe who loved the person who passes away has a swallow. I kind of love that too. It's a very, I suppose, narcissistic thing of me to think that my family would want to ingest me. But good Lord, they've been ingesting my ideas and my emotions and my struggles and my crises. My oldest son, he's adopted, he's African-American, he's much taller than I am. You wouldn't think we have a lot in common. We crisis out exactly the same way. I, we, I don't know if you noticed me before, but I had to get all my papers in line facing me, right? He was terribly messy at home now that he has his own production studio and is doing well as a music producer. The studio is spotless. He's navigating crisis. He's ingested my bones. It feels kind of good. I don't really need them to cook me when I die. Acting class number two, folks. People tend to run from fear. That makes sense. But you got it backwards. It's danger you run from. It's fear you face. Danger, get the hell out of Dodge. Warning, danger, danger, danger. Fear says, come here, aren't you curious? That's why successful actors are always telling you on talk shows, they're sitting there on Charlie Rose saying, why did you do the project? Why this project, Jennifer? Because it frightened me. Because I didn't think I could. 
because it was a character unlike anything I had ever explored before, and I thought I would fail. The great Meryl Streep will say, I didn't even think I could learn all those lines anymore, Academy Award, August Osage County. Right? They run toward what they fear because there's something they fear more. Complacency. The status quo. The end of curiosity. And so when we court our curiosity, we find ourselves facing our fears. And an actor cannot immerse in a role, and truly we cannot immerse deeply in our lives until we start to face those fears. Alex, I wouldn't even have children. I'm terrified of children. I don't like babies and dogs. And now I want to hold everybody's baby, and I have a dog that speaks English. And I adopted one child and birthed another, and I wish I had two dozen. I completely get those TV shows with the two dozen because I look at her and her beautiful belly in this beautiful moment with this life about to come. But I was so afraid, afraid to fall in love, uh, afraid to enter a singular commitment, afraid to get even fatter. I've never been so thin and lovely as you. Uh, afraid of the pain. These are the things we fear. Pain, rejection, loss, the abyss, failure. But when we run toward failure, we stand the opportunity to succeed. I know I'm going to fail at that. I can't learn all those lines. I could never pull that off. I won't find the connections. I don't know if I'll find another actor, hello, on the set to connect with. But then I go back and I remember all I have to do is say, what's it like to be human for you? And now I can navigate that fear and nurture my curiosity. I might even have to put my glasses on. Oh, you're a very different sort of person. You're not like the other people I met today. You've got so much going on. You've got so many different stories going on and just your outfit alone, the story you're trying to tell about who you are, you're trying to see like I am, and even with my fuzzy vision like my, oh my, oh there he is. So now I'm anchored. So now I can face my fears because I have this gentleman and I have her, pink hair and dog, and my friend in the back, and you. And I'm getting all these different stories. And so now as an actor, because I'm going fearlessly into the lives of others, those stories are now filling me up and enriching my life. What's the next lesson? Oh, wait, let's go back. Now, here we go. Oh, boy, more death and dying. Acting class number two, begin with the end in mind. Good Lord, we're going to get through these pretty quickly and on to the better ones, on to the lighter ones. Begin with the end in mind is great, though. I'm a nutty one. I read the last chapter of the book. I actually read the last line of the book. It comes from my days in Hollywood as a development executive where everybody tells you these first 10 pages to see if it's going to be a good movie. I read the last 10. I read the ending. If it was gripping and compelling and filled me with curiosity, I had to read the beginning, and then I would plunge into the middle. I like to see movies that way too and read books that way. I read the end, then I read the forward, then I jump all through the book in a non-linear way, letting it speak to wherever I am in my life that day. I keep about eight books on my dressing table at all times. There's usually half a dozen scripts I'm coaching people through, and I don't decide what I'm going to pick up. I let myself organically reach out for the material, flip it open, and then ingest that material. I begin with the end in mind means I know my purpose. I know my intention. I know what I'm in it for. And so that gives meaning to the journey. I don't need to know the surprise ending at the end of the movie. I love knowing the ending and then seeing how they're going to get me there. Because folks, I don't want to spoil it for you, but Jon Snow lives and you don't. We know the ending. We get up every day and we know the ending, but we don't live with the end in mind. We don't begin with the end in mind. And so we meander and we lose our way and a crisis hits and we think it's real. We think it's the end of us. It might be the end of the story. If the crisis is real and present danger, the man with the gun pointing it into your car, shooting you, that's danger. But mostly, we're responding again to a crisis. 
something we're thinking about, dread of the future or obsession about the past, not real and present danger. If I begin with the end in mind, it changes how I look back and how I look forward. Well, after class number three, we talked about that actors run toward their fear, not away from it. These are some of the benefits of running toward your fear. Uh, the beautiful uh, classic musical West Side Story. I know there's plenty of you here who know it. For the quick ones who don't, it's Romeo and Juliet set in Brooklyn in the 1950s, late 1950s, early 1960s. Incredible score, incredible music, incredible dancing. And it's Romeo and Juliet. It's a love story. And so Tony has fallen impossibly and dangerously in love with his Maria. But before he meets her, he's given one of the great all-time songs ever written for a musical. It's called, Who Knows? And there's the lyric up there. I don't sing, I'm not gonna do that to you. But something's coming, I don't know what it is, but it is gonna be great. Who knows? Something's coming, I don't know what it is, but it is gonna be great. The air is humming and something great is coming. What an incredible way to look at the abyss. At the abyss, it may be, it's going to be great. Who knows? Acting class number four. Can we let go of being experts, please? I know that's what we're all here doing today, but not really. This is the unted. This is where all of us are experts. This is where any one of us who's having a moment in our lives, a journey in our life, a story to tell, gets up and gathers with others and says, this is what it's like to be human for me and how I'm navigating nonprofit, artificial intelligence, how to paint your bedroom for $5. This is what I love about Bill. Bill is about celebrating discovery rather than knowing. We're here learning things together, discovering things together. You know, as parents, we often get stuck in being the expert. And I almost missed my children altogether, my Buddha, because your children, Alex, are your Buddha. They come to teach us many lessons. But I stood there trying to teach my child how to scramble eggs, but he had his way. And I almost missed how he scrambles eggs. I almost missed watching him discover because I thought I had to be the expert. When an actor is trying to immerse into a role, if they go at it as if they're supposed to know, as if they're supposed to be the expert, they tighten up, they panic, and they lose their way. Just like we do when somebody says, tell me exactly what you know, do it perfectly, you in the striped shirt, and don't fuck up at all because everybody said you're the expert in striped shirt being you thing at hand jacket. So, and we can't function, we can't be human, we can't laugh in that circumstance. What's it like being human for you? I wish we taught our babies to ask that question instead of what do you do for a living? On airplanes, when people ask me what I do, I often say, I make things up. I'll sometimes make up whatever role, whatever actor I'm coaching is doing, just to more deeply explore. I told you, liars, con artists, and thieves. But when is the last time you looked at somebody you thought you knew, you looked at a friend or a colleague, and you said, oh, I know you. I know what you're doing. I know what's going to come from you. It's the death of love, it's the death of friendship, it's the death of discovery. What's it like to be human for you? The next one is a quick practice, it's not acting class. We're gonna take a short break. We're gonna have a little practice. In order to face these tools, acting classes one through four, I think we've done, You've got to be able to step in and step out of character. Now, in your case, that means to step in and step out of your life. That means to step in and step out of the melodramatic story or comedic story you're telling about your life. And what do you get for doing that? 
Well, you can face terrifying moments. You can take a mental vacation. You can regain your perspective. And you can make decisions more effectively. Did my light just go out? Is it time for me to stop? I'm going to wrap up these last classes with you as quickly as I can. When you step into character, when you immerse yourself in the story more completely, how hungry you are, how much you'd like me to get to the end, how eager you are to hear the thing that you came here to hear, when we immerse ourselves in the moment, all these wonderful, expansive things can happen. That's why we like to step into the drama of our lives. Folks, that's why we create the crises, so that we can be present and immersed and exhilarated by having to solve those problems. But then you can step out and take a look at what you're doing, just like an actor stepping in and out of character. Acting class number five, pay attention. It's self-explanatory, I'll just say this, we don't. We take our mindfulness meditation classes so that we will learn to pay attention, taste the food, feel our feet in the shoes. For just one second, if we could all just stop talking and being somewhere and thinking about what we have to do next, if we could just take one moment together to come entirely present. We really don't have any choice, do we? It's all there is. All the rest of it is just our fantasizing about the future and our obsessing about the past. But wasn't that a nice little vacation? That'll kick a crisis right in its ass. It's been a tough week. It's been a tough year in America. It's been a tough 400 years. It's been a tough 1,000 years. It's tough being human. And after 400 years of oppression in our country that we are shocked, that we are surprised by the amount of violence and racism and hatred offends me. Not just because I have a mixed family, not just because I'm of mixed heritage. It offends me because it denies the truth. It denies the truth of our fears and our failures and our disappointments as a culture. And if we would look at them if we would own our fears and the things that trigger our panic, then maybe we wouldn't need to pull the trigger to deal with our fear. Acting class number six, run. If you possibly can, if it's danger, if it's a fucking bear, run. If you can get away, your whole body, your whole system, your whole psyche, wants to run. Sometimes you're in crisis because you won't run. Now, I have an okay body, but I want you to take a look at a really great part of my body. It's these thighs, baby. And I got a tush. I'm not going to turn around and show the cameras, but I got one powerful skier's tush on me. And the fact is the skinniest of you has some great thighs and to ass because we're supposed to run away. All the other creatures are bigger and scarier and louder and thumpier, but we are great at running the fuck away. But we tell ourselves we can't. We let our ego, we let our issues make us fight battles we don't have to fight. I'm not afraid of conflict. I'm just conflict choosy. I will march on Sunday. I will march on Monday. I will march twice a week for as many weeks as it takes for our country to awaken, for our country to have real change. Acting class seven, we're there, we're at the end. There's always an escape hatch. No matter what shit you're dealing with, no matter how bad it is, we just don't think there's an escape hatch because we don't always consider what the little boy in Schindler's List did, which is to jump in a toilet full of shit to escape. We don't always think jumping into the problem is an escape hatch. But time travel is an escape hatch also. I don't have to be in the power of now. I don't have to come present if the present is sucky poo poo. If the present is horrific, I can remember dying. I can think about the future. 
if the present is horrific, the only escape hatch may be death. Three times in the film, the character escapes to death and doesn't die. It's a film about facing our fears and facing our world. So be bold, dance and sing and be crazy and be absurd. Do the things you're terrified of doing just for kicks to expand who you are, to bring yourself present and to navigate crisis right in the middle of your next big problem. Do the thing you think will make it worse just to see what happens. But don't say I said that. The worst thing happens in Hamilton Hamilton's son is killed in a duel. I, don't, I didn't remember that part of history. I don't know if you did. And Hamilton and his wife move uptown and have to grieve the death of their son, a death the wife blames her husband for. And yet, she finds an escape hatch, one of the most powerful escape hatches from crisis that exists. She finds forgiveness like the mother whose son was shot by a would-be gangbanger and went to jail and was giving, being given a sentence. And she went and appeared before the judge and begged for leniency. Listen to me, I know you're hungry. She begged for leniency for the boy who killed her son, the young man who killed her son. And the judge was not terribly lenient, and so the woman once a week for his entire sentence, went to visit the young man and appeared before the parole boards and got him an early release and then brought him, the man who killed her son, to live with her. And I saw these people on a talk show where they were teaching forgiveness. It's humbling the power of forgiveness. Those escape hatches are all around us. We just don't see them. Now, I have two little stories to tell you, and I'm going to wrap it up. The fact is, I've, uh, I didn't lie. I wasn't entirely forthcoming about why I'm so nervous. Um, because unlike you, I'm actually dying. I have aggressive stage 4 metastatic synovial sarcoma, which is Latin for I'm fucked and I'm in a two-year window. So I've been facing crisis. And standing up here and telling the truth about that, not so easy. So what do I do? How do I look into the abyss? How do I use the tools of time travel when it hurts, when I'm in pain? I just go to Hawaii or the ocean or my husband's arms. This is my 12-year-old, and when we had to tell him, when we're very honest with our children, I told him uh, that we'd gone from decades to five years to under a two-year window, he burst into laughter. Okay, I've worked enough with people in emotional crisis to know that's just like tears. He said, oh, this is hilarious. This is preposterous. They told us decades. You look fine. You're fat and happy. This is hilarious. This is preposterous. 12. I couldn't help it. We started to giggle together. But then the questions came. Will it hurt? Are you scared? Are you going to look weird? Because my son has learned to navigate crisis with curiosity. I lied. I'm sorry. I told you, liars, con artists, and thieves, there is one more class. It's the class that sums them all up. It's the last class. It's the eighth class. It's when you realize that we are the stories we tell, right in the middle of a crisis. I have a tattoo. It's an odd tattoo. I got it so that when my body is uh, taken for collection for organs and whatnot, they'll see it. Um, I got it so that people will ask me about it because I hear when you have a tattoo, people say, what is that, until you, your head wants to explode. And so mine says Viola Van Cleef. Um, Viola Van Cleef was a three-year-old girl, a beautiful little girl who was beaten to death by her foster mother and tossed into an unmarked grave. And I like this story because a man 
on the other side of town from where Viola lives, read about it, and arranged for a tombstone. I like to think about that man and his humanity. I like to think about what it did for the social worker who maybe got one more hour of patience because of his humanity to help another child in crisis. I like to think about the reporter, the character of the reporter, who thought to write that story. I like to think about the person who cut her tombstone. Her tombstone is next to another three-year-old girl who was also beaten to death. I like to think of the two of them playing. We are the stories we tell. I've put the seven classes here for you, like planets, like constellations, because you don't have to do them in order. You don't have to remember them like experts. You can just travel to them in the solar system where they live when you're in crisis. Pay attention to what scares you. There's so much learning there. Remember, there's always an escape hatch. Like my son, sons, husband, friends, choose discovery over comfort. And if you can, and if you're up for it, and if you will, discover the joy of looking death right in the eye and saying, come and get me, brother. It's all good. I cannot begin to tell you the calm and the peace and the joy that comes over me when I look right at it. I wish that for you many, many, many years before a diagnosis. I wish that for the baby in that belly, that she will immerse, emerge herself, immerse herself in the world and in her life. Thank you so much. <laughs>